Hi, uh, my name is Zach Abrams. I'm the data editor here at the Business of Business. And today in the studio, we have uh, an, an influential figure in the NFT space, one of my close friends, Andrew Wang. Um, Andrew was a part of a project recently called Relief UKR that gathered artists together from the NFT community along with builders. He stayed up all night, I'm sure you'll tell us about that, and launched a collection that sold out in 30 seconds, generating a million dollars in charity profit, um, even more in recurring donations since then. So we're going to talk about both that project and Andrew's thoughts about the Web3 space, what it's doing that traditional finance can't keep up with, and why he's so excited every day to engage with artists, builders, and collectors in the space. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm glad you said over a million dollars because the price of Ethereum fluctuates. So True. when we had the primary sale and we sold out over a million dollars in 30 seconds, I think it was like a million dollars and 50,000. So we had a little bit of a blanket. And then about a day ago, the price of <laughs> Ether went down. So all of a sudden people were saying, well, it wasn't a million dollars. <laughs> well, right. Just on the record, it, it was. And I think it might be back up now. So that's that's crypto for you. But I think there's a really cool story behind this. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about how the initial idea came together. Uh, who did you reach out to first? What were those early few hours like? I think what's amazing about this is that it wasn't an initial idea. Nobody was sitting around and saying, hey, let's do this thing. It doesn't really start with me. I mean, I think if you read some of the media about it, it's like, you know, Andrew felt this way about what was happening in Ukraine and he made this tweet and then it started. But it really was like I, I put out a tweet really just asking a simple question, which was, can we in the NFT space, not only with the capital we have, but with the tools we have, like smart contracts, DAOs, things like that, can we do something to help? It wasn't even saying like we have this idea to help. It's just putting that question out there because it's worth asking. You know, when day in and day out, all I do is look at NFTs and look at monkey JPEGs. Can can that ecosystem, can we pull out some, some good things from there and do something? And I really wasn't expecting anything. I was planning to have that tweet flop and then maybe later I would get some ether together to just find a find a place to donate crypto. And a few people responded. Actually, a lot of people did. And in one of the kind of sub sub replies, uh, Sudvik Sethi was like, yeah, we'd have to make sure that this was vetted, that it wasn't anonymous founders who could just steal the money. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. And then uh, Geo, Geo Gustin came in and he was like, yo, I'm, I'm down to help. He's a co-founder of Smilesverse, really popular NFT collection. And then all of a sudden we were just in a group chat together, the three of us. And then we were like, okay, we need a dev. And then two seconds later, um, Mark, our dev, was in it. So all of a sudden, we just had a ragtag team. And we're like, okay, we're here, so we might as well do something. And and that's what I mean by it wasn't really an idea. It just sort of happened, which is what's pretty common in the NFT space, I would say. Uh, we don't always know what we're making, but in the process, we start to figure out, you know, maybe we're actually doing something interesting here. And then we had the idea, well, we have so many artists in the space. Why don't we bring artists in? Right. What if they contributed art and what if we created an NFT collection? Because, you know, NFT collections sell out. People like NFTs, people like art. And all of a sudden, you know, we were going and we just didn't want to stop until we were able to execute and put that product out there. That's great. So uh, 37 artists in total, right, contributed 200 NFTs to the project and the collection sold out within 30 seconds. What was that like? when you hit launch, you saw the incredible interest. I personally tried to mint one, my transaction failed. Uh, so what was that like? So I failed too. And <laughs> and most of most of our artists failed as well. We were all in that Zoom call together saying, all right guys, mint, mint, mint. And then we all failed. And we lost like $50 <laughs> in gas. But um, you know, part of that was wanting to make everything transparent as possible. Nobody on the team um, held back any NFTs. We didn't get any equity. All the administrative fees were paid by us from our personal wallets. Um, all the artists wanted it to go to charity and towards charitable causes. And so at that moment, we were all okay with what was gonna happen. One of the cool things is that NFT projects are sort of in this bind right now, where you either do um, this allow list or, or presale program, which helps people get in, um, 
people who have contributed, people who have been selected, curated, and it saves on gas fees. But in some ways, it's also kind of like a black box. People grind for it. It feels unfair. It feels unreasonable. It feels like uh, cheap marketing, really. When somebody's like, retweet this, and I'll, I'll let you mint my project and, and pay, and you don't have to fight everybody else. On the other hand, you know we have issues where if everybody can mint, then bots can get to it. I mean, in this case, we said, hey, we're putting out amazing art. If some bots are getting to it, all that money is still going to charity. So it's a, it's a rare case where we had the ultimate goal of raising that money quickly, and we, we were surprised to see it happen so fast, but it was also part of the model that, that we put out. Right, and if somebody was really interested in owning one of these pieces or interested in contributing to the project but missed that initial mint, as so many of us did, they could also buy it on a secondary marketplace, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not only that, hey, you can go buy this art, and a lot of the art is pretty accessible, in my opinion. Anywhere from, you know, $100 to some of our best-selling artists who are going for you know, a few thousand. But what's cool about this is that it's not just about buying it again. Because of NFTs, we have secondary market royalties. And so every time something is resold, the collection gets a royalty percent, which we set to the max of 10%. And all of that either goes towards charity or supporting our artists in the collection who are in Ukraine, fearing for their lives right now. So, so that money does go back into the ecosystem, which is really cool. It's a, it's a pretty unique facet of NFTs. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about the artists you found. So not only artists that have uh, done the art behind collections such as Cool Cats or Danny Cole, uh, whose sweater you're rocking right now, but you also connected with Ukrainian artists. Tell me what it was like connecting with them, uh, adding them to the project. What was that process like? Absolutely. So with the Ukrainian artists, um, our original team was Sutvik, Gio, myself, and Mark, our dev. At some point, we were like, hey, we should try to bring in more Ukrainian artists. And late at night, I went into my DMs, and there was this woman named Alexandra, who's Ukrainian, and she was saying, how can I help? You know, I'm in Dubai right now, but I see what's happening, and I'm, I'm in the art world, I'm in the Ukrainian art scene, how can I help? And I was like, oh my goodness, there you go. Like, that's Web3, right? There's probably always somebody in your DMs who can help <laughs> you. Like, they're probably already there. And we brought her onto the team. And she said she was in touch with artists in Ukraine, working out of Ukraine, going through a lot of the same things that we see on the news that, that you, Ukrainian people are suffering through. And she said, I can contact them and we can get them their art and I'll make sure they understand this project, know what it means and that they're a part of it. And that was how we got artists like, you know, Julia Believa. She has a piece in the collection of herself with her daughter. Um, it's kind of like a, a spin. It's this conceptual spin on, on this nativity scene. But at the same time, like she is in Ukraine right now. And until recently, we weren't sure if she was safe. She was protecting her daughter. And wow. I think that's amazing. And all the Ukrainian artists on the team just had an amazing background as well. And some even helped us coordinate. You know, one of the artists in the collection, um, Raskolov, he has ties to Ukraine, his family in Ukraine. He's in Mexico City right now, and he's been coordinating. He's been having talks with the Minister of Defense, the Ministry of Health. Wow. Like, I had no idea you could just take those meetings. Like, if I tried to call the Minister of Health, who's the <laughs> Minister of Health in America? I, I feel like I should know that. Um, we probably don't even call it a, a ministry. But um, the fact that he was able to do that and coordinate with us while also putting out art himself goes to show what Web3 can do. Like, it's all hands on deck. Where people can help, they help. And... We are pretty diverse too, which is cool. Yeah. Were any of the Ukrainian artists either skeptical or just didn't know a lot about Web3 or NFTs? Or was there any uh, challenge in onboarding them or explaining to them exactly what this project entailed? Mm -hmm. So the Ukrainian artists that we brought on, they're all familiar with Web3. They're familiar with NFTs. I think all of them have made strides and changed the digital art scene in Ukraine. And, and in Europe, one way or another. Um, so I think when Alexandra reached out to some of them and some Ukrainian artists, Russian artists who you know, felt for what was going on in Ukraine as well, which we have in the collection, they, they were down, they were down with it. And what's cool about the project is that we've always been transparent with where the money goes, how we come to those decisions. Because of the blockchain, you can see all of that. We made it simple so that anybody could click a link 
and click the next link and see that money moving around, which is super cool. We're, we're trying to solve for a lot of the inefficiencies and opaqueness of, of many nonprofits. Absolutely. And I wanted to ask you along those lines. I've seen some Twitter sentiment. Um, obviously, there's a lot of excitement around Web3, crypto, blockchain, NFTs, all of that. There are a lot of people that are looking at that excitement and looking on with skepticism, saying a lot of companies are investing into the metaverse. You have Facebook changing their name to Meta. But very few people seem to be able to articulate what exactly Web3 is, what exactly the metaverse is, and why we should be interested, and what technologies or abilities it's bringing to us that don't already exist. So do you see this project as a, uh, a case study for the powers of Web3? I think the first thing is that we hope that it becomes a case study, which means people have to look at it. Uh, in terms of media, a lot of us are skeptical about mainstream media because we're like, hey, why do you only write about scams? Why do you write about people's board apes getting stolen? Uh, somebody stole, you know, millions of dollars in in Ether and Bitcoin, and that's that's the space. Uh, for us, it feels like this should be one of those cases where it's like, look, we did this thing, and you can raise questions about it, you can give feedback about it, but ultimately it demonstrates how quickly we can move with the tools we have. And by the tools, I mean smart contracts. The fact that we're able to have our dev help us deploy a smart contract in about 32 hours, right? Something that said, look, this is the collection, this is the mint price, this is where you go for it, this is how it's handled, it's gonna you know, give you this art, and you know, all of that is, is shown on the blockchain. The fact that we have that, the fact that we're able to also uh, create a multi-sig wallet, which means that before we set off funds, nobody on our core team could just say like, hey, I'm sending funds here, right? There's like a layer of trustlessness mm. where it's like everybody has to sign off and and send it off. And it's called like a Genosis multi-sig wallet. We call it the, we call it the Noki wallet. Um, is it Noki or Noki? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, besides that, I think there are more tools as well. Um, those are kind of like the hard tools. We also have softer tools that are super, super important. We have artists, right? Uh, this is a space that cares about artists. You know, I think we could care about them more, but I think this was also trying to show us that, you know, here are amazing artists in our space, some of the most well-known, some of the closest to what's happening in Ukraine, and here's the collection. Um, being able to put out art is really cool, right? It's different when you just donate somewhere, whereas when you know you're getting something in return, and when that's incredible art at lower prices, that get made up for in secondary royalties. That's cool. One last thing in terms of tools that people don't think about a lot is that community is a tool. Community is not just marketing. It's not just a buzzword. We wanted to show people that community could be a tool in this case because we asked ourselves, could we leverage the community in basically a day to show up, not only to provide art and coordinate with us, but to buy the art, to talk about it, to tell their friends, to give feedback on it, to audit our smart contract, to make sure that we were legitimate, right? All of that is is community. And we build that up every day. Like, you know, when, when this is not the biggest news story, what's happening in Ukraine, we're still showing up and buying art, talking about NFTs, bringing people together. If we're good actors, and hopefully that's shown on the blockchain with our transactions as well, then we have people who trust in us, right? You have the level of trustlessness with crypto and blockchain and smart contracts, but then you have the layer of trust that you get to build on top of that. And you have to leverage both. And so that's what I mean by tools. I hope right. this is a story about tools and how we can use them. Right, and it's the community aspect of it can be seen now because nowadays NFT projects that have 10,000 items in their collection take months to market, build up followings on Twitter, Discord, you know, uh, come from the dev team presenting a ro roadmap saying these are our plans for the capital. Whereas this project, what was the total time between the genesis of that group chat with the three of you and the launch date of the project? It was probably about 30 hours. Right, so 30 and hours to sell over 7,000 items. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, it, it still blows my mind to this point. And I think all of us hope that it's an example of doing good with it, right? The tools of Web3 are just tools. They're, they're neutral. If you have a hammer, you can use a hammer as a weapon or you can use it to build a house and we want to build a house with it and 
and hopefully continue to do that. I mean, hopefully things like this don't happen again, but we know what's happening in Ukraine is, is ongoing. Don't know if it'll end anytime soon. So we can keep calling on models like these and keep iterating and, and keep making it better. The fact that um, the project itself has disclosed the location of the wallet on the blockchain where these funds are being held, the Twitter account um, at Relief XYZ, is it? Yeah, it's, it's Relief with a three in the second E. It's a it's a nod to Web3 right. and, and what we can do. So it's R-E-L-I-3-F XYZ. We will link it, of course. <laughs> but um, the Twitter account has been very forthcoming about the decisions behind where it's distributing the funds, where they can do the most help. I'm wondering, though, to a skeptical person, they might be saying, if it was before this mint, if I was looking into this project, how am I supposed to know whether it's a scam making use of an event that's in the news, a tragic event, in order to you know, pull on people's heartstrings and make off with that million dollars plus? How am I supposed to know whether it's a scam or whether it's something legitimate I can buy into? That's a tougher tool. It's not something you can look up on the blockchain or you can determine through traditional means if, it, if your bank is FDIC insured or something like that. What would you say to somebody who's skeptical about how to evaluate not just this project, but any project in the NFT space? No, it's a really good point. I mean, we launched this in a climate where there have been a lot of scams and rug pulls. And we talk about scams and rug pulls. We don't necessarily say like, hey, you know, these people didn't have a project and you paid for nothing or you connected your wallet and we stole all your stuff. We also use it in the context of, hey, you were seeking a huge valuation. There are projects that raised like $70 million off hype and false promises and came out with art that just was not great. And this has been happening a lot, you know, over the last over the last few weeks. And that's that's an unfortunate part of the space. But what's important for this project to understand is that in theory, right, it, it could have been a scam, but we wanted to put so much on the line that it wouldn't make sense for us to steal that amount of money, right? You know, I have 140 something thousand followers on Twitter. All of them are NFT people, um, maybe a few haters here and there, but um, I'm putting my reputation on the line for everybody there. If I make one mistake like that, if you see me steal that money and put it back in my own account and run off, I can never show my face in the NFT space again, at least not as Andrew Wang. And you know, it's been kind of fun, so hopefully I can do that. Um, same thing for all the other founders, Sudvik, Gio, Alexandra, Mark, Raskolov, right? All of us have reputations in the space. We have artists, right? 37 artists who came in as well. We talked with them and they all knew that if this project failed, their reps would be on the line as well. But to them, I hope I can speak for them, that small, small amount of risk was, was worth it for what we could do. And I say it's a small amount of risk because you can clearly see how much reputation is on the line. That's what, we, that's what we say when reputation is everything. That's why we use Twitter as well. You know, you can delete tweets, but NFT people are serial screenshotters as well. <laughs> right. Uh, tweets aren't exactly committed to the blockchain, but there generally is a good public record of what somebody has said. Um, that's interesting. I think recently there was the story of the two um, Bitcoin. They've officially been charged with money laundering, but it's seems likely that they were also responsible for the hack of millions of dollars of Bitcoin that have increased in value a ton. And a lot of the media coverage focused on the fact that she was a silly rapper, right? But what I think was under discussed was the fact that they weren't able to spend much of the money at all. He was, they were eventually tracked down in part because of a $500 Walmart gift card that they bought. Um, because the FBI has gotten really good at unscrambling a lot of the blockchain methods that people use to try to scramble their tracks and hide their tracks and I think like Bitcoin has has a public perception of being used by criminals by people who don't want their identity known but in a lot of these high profile cases the people connected to these hacks or to these dark market exchanges have been caught through blockchain means I mean one thing I'll say is that it's very easy to make a mistake right and that's kind of the philosophy about bad actors is that yeah you can make a shadow wallet you can make a wallet that nobody knows is attached to you and you can do shady things on it but usually at some point if you are doing bad things consistently you might get away with a couple of things but if it's a lot of money or if it's a lot of unethical things usually you make a mistake somewhere 
And we've seen that happen. I've been able to, you know, like kind of like crowdsource investigations live. We can start a Twitter space and be like, hey, somebody stole this money, which this actually happened. We said, hey, somebody just stole $350,000 from a project. Can we find out who did this? And, you know, I feel like I'm kind of like an amateur sleuth. I'm good at Etherscan. I can jump from this to this to that. Some people are really good because they're able to create like really good like maps of where money is going and, and like, you know, cash flow, things like that. Uh, it, it's super cool. They're, they're, they're great. Um, I kind of get confused a little bit, but we were able to do that in real time for, for another project. It was called Creature Toads that, that, that got scammed. And somebody was like, hey, we're very close to figuring out who this person is because we've connected it to, to certain accounts that may be able to help us in identifying the person because they have KYC. And so, you know, investigations like this are, are done in different ways. People get creative with it, which is also cool, right? Like just as scammers and bad actors are creative, um, good people, you can say white hats, et cetera, et cetera, um, are also creative. So it's like this constant battle. But I think it's important to say that crypto has come a long way from being that dark web, you know, mm. drugs, money laundering, you know, ecosystem. I, I think that was part of the perception maybe about 10 years ago. That has changed a lot. You know, people are using it for good. Entire governments like El Salvador are, are adopting Bitcoin. Like that's that's amazing. Um, we, we hope that what's going on in Ukraine with, with all, all the atrocities that are happening right now, I hope people are seeing um, not only what, what crypto can do in terms of reducing friction, you know, I, I'm pretty sure right now um, banks have a limit of about $4,000 US dollars per day withdrawals in Ukraine. You know, if you're an individual, like I rarely spend more than a couple hundred dollars a day uh, in my real life in fiat. <laughs> uh, I'll spend 10 times that in the NFT world without thinking. But, um, you know, I don't need $4,000 a day. But if you're a nonprofit or a charity, you probably need that. Or if something dire happens and you need those funds immediately for something large scale, how can you only withdraw 4,000, right? You're screwed. And so I hope that's a story about crypto, but I think what our story is, and I hope others who, who follow after us, who have been doing things like this as well, um, also see that it's about community, that it's about artists, right? That it's about our smart contracts, so our tools, and, and what we can do when we come together and sh such a short amount of time, we can still do something pretty cool. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if you have thoughts about, um, recently there was some controversy among the NFT Twitter when BuzzFeed News revealed the real identities of several of the founders of Yuga Labs, right? Mm -hmm. That's behind Board Apes Yacht Club, which is one of the biggest NFT projects out there. You see a lot of celebrities buying in. Um, previously, they had been known as pseudonyms. They had Twitter accounts, but they didn't operate under their own name. You're somebody in the space who operates under your own name. You're not shy about showing your face on a program like this or on your Twitch streams, um, though many people will know you by your profile pictures, which is usually something upside down. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on the doxing, as they call it, or the revealing of people's real identities, or do you think this space should permit people to operate under a pseudonym given that maybe their real life finances or their origin or their work history may not be able to be tracked, but everything in this Web3 sphere from Twitter mentions to you know, cryptographic wallet exchanges can be tracked. Yeah, so when that article from BuzzFeed came out, I think people were really, really upset. and. My first reaction was that too, right? I, I think part of it was because I didn't think the article was particularly well written, right? So we were more talking about like what the article did versus what the article is about. I don't even remember what the article is about. I just remember that that paragraph where, where they said who their names were and basically said, you know, they, they haven't done anything that, that seems illegal or, or wrong, something like that. Um, hopefully you can fact check that. Um, but but I, I think a lot of the NFT community was upset because in some ways we champion anonymous and pseudonymous identities when they serve some sort of good. Twitter believes this as well. Twitter always says, you know, anonymous doesn't equal not real. Um, and, and that's because when you're anonymous, you can be more yourself, right? You can take on personas. 
a lot of people in the NFT space are here for second chances, right? A lot of people in the space have, for example, like I know friends who have been incarcerated and you can imagine that when they're not fully doxxed, right? It, if you're out there in the real world and you've been incarcerated, it can be very hard to get a job, to get a loan, things like that. In the NFT space, when you're transacting with Ether, right? Don't care if, if, if you've been incarcerated. Like I, you know, I, I believe in a rehabilitative system and believe in reform. And like, just because you're incarcerated doesn't mean you, you can't transact or, or be a part of this community, right? Like you would have to do other things to, to show that you weren't welcome in the community. Um, I, I, I think there is that kind of celebration of people getting to be themselves and, and express themselves more fully. With that said, there's also the side that's like, if you're raising a ton of money, if you're raising millions of dollars, you should have more ways of being accountable to your investors and people buying in. Really anybody in the ecosystem. Um, you know, I, I guess the way that I think about it is, I think being doxxed is one of the, the best ways to put your reputation on the line, right? It's like, here's me, here's my track record, here's what I'm known for, right? If you can look up my name, and find out that as some in the NFT space were recently outed for, been in the Panama Papers twice. Mm. <laughs> you know, I feel like that should that should be info that's probably out there if I'm running a business and I'm trying to raise money. Um, you know, with that said, I do think there there's there's a way where somebody's pseudonymous or potentially anonymous, but can show in a very short time frame that they've hit on a lot of benchmarks that they've executed that they've done right by their investors. And that to me helps a lot. Um, I prefer people who are doxxed. It just helps me put a lot more trust in them because we are in a time where there are a lot of scams and rug pulls happening. This is the kind of milieu that relief is, is dropping in, which is maybe why it resonated with people. Um, but with the Board Ape Yacht Club specifically, I, I had a tweet that was pretty against their doxing, um, in, in part because I wanted to celebrate how we have a lot of pseudonymous and anonymous identities who have done a lot of good. Um, you know, with that said, I think I took some time to think about it. And I think ultimately, you know, when you're when you're a company, uh, last I heard they were raising $5 billion um, for the Bored Apes. You know, I, I generally think, you know, one of, one of the cool things is when there's information out there, somebody may know things that you don't. I think to me, that's one of the more compelling ideas behind this. Right, like, you know, I, I know you as my friend. I don't think you've ever done anything bad, but somebody else could come to me like, hey, you know, Zach did this thing to me, right? Like, and and that I think is one of the, 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 the main draws of doxing for me. And to be clear, doxing has kind of a different connotation in the space right. than, than doxing. We talk about doxing journalists, it's like, you know, here's where the journalist lives, let's, let's go abuse them, let's go send hate mail, death threats, etc. Um, like outing them in that way. Uh, being doxxed also is kind of like a neutral thing in the space. It's like, you know, my name is out there, my face is out there, you can find me in my track record. Uh, ultimately with the Bored Apes, um, I'm still figuring out my thoughts on it. I, you know, they, they, they are registered as an LLC. So that information was public if you went to find it hard enough. Right. And I, I think to me, like, I'm interested in that as well. A lot of people know how I look, but a lot of people think, I'm an upside down cool cat or that I'm an anime character with a joint and, and powder blue hair. But if they really wanted to find out, they, they could find me and, and have that have that verification. Right. I want to ask you, while I still have you, about another project that you've been involved with, which is Andrew Yang's uh, political lobby called Lobby 3. Um, that's an example of a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization, which is a common uh, Web3 instrument for having a bunch of people who hold either an NFT or who hold a crypto token being able to take votes and decide the future of a project or decide, uh, you know, vote on anything that any other organization would vote on. So could you walk us through Lobby 3 and its plans for taking on Washington? Yeah, well, first of all, it was awesome to get to work with Andrew Yang. I mean, <laughs> does know, he people, know that you were once suspended by Twitter for impersonating him? During o- only a you, debate? only you and the real ones know. So during the during the Democratic debates, I did change my name to Andrew Yang 
and I tweeted something like open the borders and I got a ton of likes <laughs> and then I woke up the next morning at 5 a.m. in a cold sweat like I, I felt great after that tweet I woke up the next day I, I thought it was funny uh, I woke up the next day at 5 a.m. in a cold sweat and I was like something's wrong <laughs> and I ran over to my computer <laughs> and sure enough I was banned from Twitter um, but but besides that, temporarily. it's also temporarily. Imagine how different your life would be today if you were banned permanently. Yeah, you know, I never would have found NFTs probably if I if I just quit Twitter because Twitter is so important to that. Um, also, people often mix up our names. Best thing I got, you know this too. Somebody asked me, if I had this tweet that was like, "Stop asking me if I'm related to Andrew Yang. That's not how it works." Um, but yeah, Lobby Three. Uh, he and his team came to me with that idea, saying that they're planning to launch it in a couple weeks. Asked if I could interview them on Spaces, help advise for them. And I was like, whoa, you know, this is cool because Andrew Yang is, in a lot of ways, he's not a mainstream politician. You know, he broke from the Democratic Party to start the Forward Party, uh, but he still is a politician, right? He's in the world of politics. He's, he's doing things with DC. He works with lobbyists, right? He has, has his message of the Forward Party, which is still, still a party. And, you know, in, 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 in concept, so I think it was cool to see him entering Web3, to know that he was keen on it, that he was also saying, like we did with Relief, what are the tools we have now and what are some cool things we can do with it? So he called on DAOs, right? And also he called on art. He got some artists together with his team and said, hey, let's create a project that raises money to basically lobby Congress on sensible crypto regulation. It's something none of us want to think about, but it is coming. It's already come. Um, I had lunch with a guy yesterday who, who represented a, uh, a, a company that was fined a, a lot of money because they were, uh, you know, SEC had, had come after them. But uh, what, what was really cool about that is, is hearing his vision, right? He knows that crypto regulation is coming and he says, we have to make it sensible, right? Uh, basically the way he explained it, there, there are two things to kind of consider right in, in the most general sense one is managing risk and one is having as much innovation as possible right this space is about innovation but there's also a lot of risk in this space and so in the simplest terms right i think if we leave it up to people who don't understand the space to come in and regulate we probably get a situation where there is a, a ton of risk management right trying to reduce risk as much as possible without caring what happens to the innovation side Mm -hmm. And I think Andrew and myself, we care about that innovation, right? We know that sometimes NFTs and crypto can feel like a bit of a wild west. We also see communities, artists coming together. We see norms forming. We see the blockchain and that transparency, right? We see small businesses forming. We see artists getting second chances, people experimenting, doing cool stuff. And we want to preserve that while also recognizing that, yes, we can work with the government. So ultimately, it's about educating people in D.C., working with lobbyists, having those meetings, right? Like taking to the house, right? Because we can't just be like, all right, we're anti-government. That's like, that's like the old crypto, mm -hmm. you know? The, the old crypto is, is uh, you know, <laughs> like that perception of, of drugs, black markets. Libertarians. Libertarians, right? And, and in some ways, like one would say that libertarians are compatible with this vision, but also so many political orientations are compatible with this. Right, so many of us care about that innovation. Um, you know, you can even make like a kind of socialist argument for why this would be interesting. Right, the idea of having a DAO where people can can have different you know shares and, and, and vote on this. Right, a kind of like co-op style approach to what often feels like a black box in DC. Right, I I hope this invites a lot more people in to think about not only what can Web three do, but what can the political world take on when we have these tools. Absolutely. Is any part of you worried that when crypto regulation comes, something like the Relief Project won't be possible just to spin up something in such a small period of time, raise this money? Uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely a worry, right? Um, I think when we talk about regulation, I'm not the best person to ask on what every regulation looks like. One of the most common things we hear are that you're selling securities, right? You're not selling art, you're not selling collectibles, you're not selling these unique items, but these are securities. You know, it has to be registered in this way. It has to, you know, fall under these these kind of strict rules. And in in this case, relief 
I don't know how you feel. It doesn't feel like a security in any sense, right? We're sharing art and, and raising money. And, and I, I think that's, that's an interesting thing uh, that you bring up. A lot of us, because the space is kind of nascent, we're just able to think, what do we want to do? And then can we get the devs together and the artists and the community builders together to make that happen? Right? Can we get from point A to point B? That's literally what this project was about, right? <laughs> There's a very clear point B, which is getting art out there and raising money for Ukraine in a very short amount of time. And you know, I, I hope we can just keep doing that. I, I want the space to innovate as much as possible, right? Because regulations are always coming in. I don't want regulations to come in too hard, too fast to the point where it stifles innovation. Right. And you got to point B very quickly, so quickly that lots of people, artists, collectors, people in the space are wondering what's next for relief. Now, I'm not asking you to tell me all of your upcoming plans, but what are you thinking about as you hear people saying, we want to get involved continuously? Does it look like an extra drop? Does it look like standardizing this model so that could, it could be applied to other situations? Like, What are you thinking about in terms of this project moving forward? All right, so I think it's time to say, Alpha alert! <laughs> we are looking at a second drop. Um, so we are trying to bring more artists together. One of the cool things was so many artists reached out. Like, maybe I should just say this, like, Justin Aversano called me. You know, wow. he's one of the biggest photographers in the space. He has an incredible story you should read into. You know, sold this photography for a million dollars at Christie's. And he was like, yo, why didn't you hit me up? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> Why did I hit you up? I didn't think you would say yes. To be fair, we didn't think anybody would say yes, right? Artists and their work, it, it's very dear to them. And he was like, no, I would have done something for you. And so many artists said that as well. Um, they've said, hey, I want to auction a piece. Hey, I want to join your collection. Hey, I've been doing this new thing that I'd love to show. And not only are these artists who care about the space, they're huge names as well. And so what we're planning to do is we want to put out another collection where, you know, this is subject to change, the, the exact mechanics. But basically what we want to do is we want to bring artists together again. And instead of doing a, a quick sellout where it's like 30 seconds, million dollars, we want to open it up for, for a timed, you know, purchase. So for 24 hours or something like that, anybody can go to a website and click mint and it'll kind of pop out any of the artist pieces. So. For 24 hours, it can be as many additions as possible before it's locked, the contract locks. And what's cool is like, it's like, hey, I'm gonna try for, pretend a Justin Aversano piece. Mint, donate, maybe I got it, maybe I did it. Maybe I get some more, right? It's so like the however minting much I would donate. be, uh, the piece you receive would be random, but you could roll the dice as many times as you wanted within that locked period. Exactly, that's what we're thinking, and you know, we made sure to implement a blind mint for the first one too, because that's part of the NFT space as well, right? It wasn't just like, hey, here's this, here's this artwork, click purchase, and then the money goes to Ukraine. We set up the smart contracts so that you could log into the website, connect your wallet, click mint, and it shows processing, and then boom, like done. And then you go to your account and be like, which piece did I get? And it's kind of fun. It's, it's about you know, what we do in the space, which is make things exciting, and. What I will say though, with the second drop, um, you know, we, we do think if there was such a response for the first one, which we didn't expect, that open edition format probably allows us to raise as much money as, as we can uh, because there's a 10% royalty limit on OpenSea right now. And you know, that, that does raise a lot of money. But if the primary sale goes well, we can also have those funds. Um, ultimately, we want this to be a use case, right? I think a lot of people can criticize us and say, you could have priced it higher, you could have sold more, because of the demand you could have made money. So you could have aligned supply and demand perfectly. Obviously that's very hard to do. Um, but I think beyond that, we want this to inspire people, right? There are better devs out there. Um, artists, hard to say. We've got some pretty cool <laughs> artists. Probably better people than me out there who can do cooler stuff. So go out and do it. Right? Don't 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 sit and, and, and watch because now that we have the tools, if you have a chance to get up and do something then maybe you should. And and that's kind of the that's kind of the goal here. That's great. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to shout out or uh, 
discuss. I, I would just like to shout out how this was totally a community effort. You know, right? Like without any of us, we would have missed out on so many things. We would have not had a smart contract. We would have not had as many Ukrainian artists. We would have not had those calls with Ukrainian government officials and people working in organizations like on the front lines right now. Um, so that's cool. And one last thing I'll say, maybe in a selfish way is, this has been really helpful for me as well. I think a lot of times we kind of mold ourselves to what the space looks like at the time. So if the space is very bullish, we're in a bear market or a bull market, right? Everybody's like super happy, super euphoric. And once we're in a bear market, people can be a little more down, right? This is in some ways kind of a bear market right now. On the other hand, if there are lots of scams and rug pulls, that also kind of gets you down. And so, and so, you know, truth be told, I, I was kind of down lately wondering, hey, has this space changed so much, right? That we've kind of lost our fundamentals. And one story that, that came out of this for myself, which was kind of cool, was that my first real entry into NFTs was back on July 1st, when I was struggling as a freelance journalist and wasn't making much money. And I put all the money I had available to spend at the time into a Cool Cat NFT, which was the upside down Cool Cat, the rarest Cool Cat. And I did that because I saw what I wanted to be in the artist clan who said, I'm a struggling freelance artist too. And this is my second chance at bringing back the character I grew up with and created and know and love. And I did that. And how cool it is, or how cool is it that a few months later, you know, a couple days ago, we're launching this project. And at first, you know, I see Kwan as like this mythological figure, right? He created Cool Cats. He created the project that gave me a second chance in my career and in my life. And like, I kind of like deified him for a while that summer, last summer. It's pretty awesome that a couple days ago, I just called him and I said, yo, Kwan, can you put a piece here? He's like, yes, I got you right now. Give me 20 minutes, right? And then, and then he's like, let me do something great. And then it was done. That's ah, pretty cool to, to go full circle. And if you see his artwork, uh, it's called Sending Love. It is about going full circle. Right? It's about two cats being intertwined by thread in the middle. And it kind of feels like the space, right? We're all intertwined with one another. And I, I, I hope, you know, people keep feeling that way. Last thing I want to say. Um, we were all in that Zoom call last night when we put out that thread showing how the first part of our funds were sent out. The last thing that somebody said before we ended the call was Danny Cole, creator of Creature World, had a piece in the collection as well. Um, in, in Ukrainian, it was uh, titled Home. And the last thing he said was, guys, this was such a good use of our time. Let each day of the rest of our lives be like this. I think that just puts everything into perspective. That's beautiful. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for sitting down with me. We'll have links to Andrew's Twitter account, also the Relief UKR Twitter account and official OpenSea Marketplace in the description. Uh, thanks so much. It's great talking to you. Thank you. This is awesome. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, be sure to check out these other videos and subscribe for much more.